Okay, the next topic is how to get the most out of your security app, uh, out of your application security review. Our speaker is Nia Angelina Samir. Nia performs application security reviews as part of her role at Universal Music Group with 20 years of experience in the IT and security field. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I don't want you to wonder about my accent, so I will tell you the secret. I'm from Bulgaria. I dreamed of becoming a detective and a spy when I was a young kid. But what happened is everything changed. I got the green card lottery. I won the green card lottery, and I had to come to America. When I came, I realized it's very, very hard to find a job as a bartender or waitress. And soon I realized it's much easier to sell my technical skills. In 2000, I started working for IBM, and later, for other big companies. I have 20 years of experience in the IT and security field. And right now, I'm a uh, forensic technology manager for Universal Music Group. I'm part of the incident response team, and I'm part of the AppSec program. I have several certifications that you can see on the screen. And I'm passionate about security reviews. I want to share my passion and my stories with you. And please feel free to ask questions and make it into a discussion. So I work for the largest music rights company in the world. We have thousands of websites. We have hundreds of applications, custom-built applications. We have dozens of third-party software that we introduce to our network. So how do we manage that risk? It's a lot to review and a lot to grasp. We perform these internal security reviews for the third-party applications and for the custom web applications we build. Today, what I'm going to try to answer is how do you perform a security review? And why is it important? Who should participate in the security review? And what is the outcome? What are the takeaways from the security review? Application security review is part of the AppSec programs which most of the companies nowadays have. Raise your hand if you work for a company that has AppSec program. So security reviews are extremely important especially if you have websites or APIs that are externally facing. And research shows that the security is more cost effective if it starts in the design phase of the development of the apps. It requires a secure mindset, and that's something that you cultivate in the company. And the security review allows you as well to cultivate the security mindset, uh, mindset in the developers. You ask questions, they answer, they learn during the security review. An attacker will attack your application no matter what. They will attack your website, your infrastructure, your web services. So you need to be protected. You need to know what your risk is. Before I answer um, what questions we are trying to answer during the security review, I want to clarify some, some terminology. A threat is a potential occurrence, malicious or otherwise, that could harm an asset. Nowadays, an asset is most likely your data. So anything bad that can happen to your asset is a threat. A vulnerability is a weakness that makes the threat possible. And this may be because of poor design, configuration mistakes, inappropriate or insecure coding practices. So during a security review, we're trying to identify the assets. What are our most valuable assets that can be exposed? And then we try to identify what are the weaknesses that will allow that an attacker to attack our assets. We try to estimate how much will be the damage to the company if our assets are damaged. The average global cost of a security breach is $3.86 million. So the security review allows us 
to look at our assets and see how they can be protected or what are the weaknesses in our security controls. There are some tools that can automate the process. And I strongly recommend you looking at them. So SAS, uh, Software Composition Analysis, IIS, these are tools that can be plugged in the security software development lifecycle and to automate the process. There is threat modeling automation. And in our company, we looked at SD elements. It's a good idea. The developers answer questions about their technology and how they're implementing it. And SD elements provides at the end a report that says these are the possible vulnerabilities and how to fix them. They provide training materials. It's a little expensive. On the market, there is space for innovation in this area. But automating the threat, pro uh, threat modeling process is important because it can allow to scale. As I told you, we have dozens of outside uh, software. We have hundreds of custom-built software. So we need to scale. I will be covering some of the frameworks that we use in a security review, like OAP's AESVS, OAP's SEM, PISM, the straight threat modeling. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of custom manual security review. So we ask questions. So I'll be covering how we actually proceed with the process of security review. When we started lo uh, looking at application security testing tools, it was confusing. All these four letter, three letter words are confusing. SAS, DAS, IS, SCA. So I wanted to dedicate uh, several slides to explain the differences and what are the pros and cons of using each one of them. So SAS, static code analysis, it reviews your binary code. And it's typically done during the programming or testing software lifecycle phases. The pros include that it scales easily, it's objective, it has broad programming language support, the principle is easy to understand. You may use your IDE to scan your code, or you can upload it to a SaaS solution. It's easy, but it has negative sides. And the first one is the poor accuracy. The research shows that it's around 53% accurate. That means there are a lot of false positives. Around half of the results from a SaaS tool may be false positives. It's becoming an antiquated technology that has not evolved. SAS has no visibility to execution flow of your program. And the output is a static report that quickly becomes outdated. SAS usually requires customization and tuning when you uh, implement it. And it's not applicable in the production stages of your life cycle. As well, it's slow to, sorry, that's me trying to. And it looks at implementation flaws and not business logic. So when you have the two SAS looking at your code, it doesn't see the business logic. It sees only the implementation. The next one is dynamic application security testing tool. What it does, it looks at the application it's, it, in its running state. It simulates an attack. The pros include independ it's independent of technology, and it's very good for pen testers. Pen testers use DAS tools. It has its negative sides as well, which includes in insufficient coverage. So research shows that around 20% of your application is covered with the dust technology. So it doesn't see a lot of your application. It produces, again, a static report that quickly becomes outdated. And it's slow. The next one, the interactive 
application security testing technology. It combines SAS and DAS together. So the static code analysis and the dynamic. And it's a typically an agent in the test runtime environment of your application. The pros include a research shows that it's around 100% accuracy for the OWASP benchmarks requirements. It has no false positives. It can be used in QA and production and produces real-time results. So it's a continuous testing, DevOps friendly. You can include it in your software lifecycle. It's plug and play, so you don't need to customize it when you start using it. But it has as well negative sides. And the negative sides is that require specific language support. It has a blind spot as well. What happens is when you use IS2, it relies on your testing scenarios, on somebody manually testing your application, clicking on the different functionality, different buttons and links. And if somebody doesn't do that, or automated process doesn't do that, the IS2 doesn't see that part. So it's a blind spot for the tool. And as well, it, it requires developer to integrate it in the application. At the end of the day, you can always do manual code review, which is great, but it has its negative sides as well. It doesn't scale because a person needs to look at the code during manual code review, and it's highly subjective. It depends on the skills of the person looking at the code. Software Composition Analysis, or SCA, it provides visibility into your open source inventory. In reality, what it is, is a source library management tool. So all your third parties' uh, libraries can be managed or looked at by CSS. SCA, sorry, SCA tool. So I wanted to show you how these tools plug in, uh, in the software development lifecycle. First, when we start designing the, and develop the software, we have the security uh, requirements that we are looking at. Then comes the SAS tool. The SAS tool looks at your code and provides feedback. Then we have the DAS, IS, and the uh, SEA tools, and in production, before you go to production, we usually recommend pen testing on um, people looking at your code and trying to find vulnerabilities, not only code, but uh, uh, the application in running state. As part of our AppSec program, we assure that all the externally facing websites are protected by website application firewall or runtime Application Security Protection, RASP. If you're looking for application security testing tools, the Gartner's report, and it's hard to see, it provides the leaders, the visionaries, uh, the niche players, and the challengers in the field. So it's a good report to look at when you start uh, talking about IS tools or application security testing tools. In our company, we looked at different vendors. I'm not going to promote anybody. I'm not going to recommend anybody, but we looked at the different vendors and what they offer in the field for SAS, DAS, IS, and SEA tools. That's another way uh, of looking at security reviews. So the process, when you start, you need to organize it in one place. Because of the size of the company, we have more than one person doing security reviews. So I have a lot of colleagues doing security reviews, and we need to correlate data. So when I uh, start reviewing an application, I may need to look at old security review and another application. A tool like Atlas helps you organize that. It looks like Jira for the developers in the room, but provides one place to have all your security review data. So you can correlate, find old security reviews, and see the questions and answers from the development team. It provides as well out of the box questions that you can customize and send to the team. 
And we will go through the questions that we usually ask. It's a lot of questions. So during the security review, you probably need to prepare to ask at least 50 questions to get an idea about the application. And it's good if it's in one place, the answers, and you can always review. So threat modeling. This is a process for finding potential vulnerabilities. We ensure that we know what the vulnerabilities are, how to enumerate and prioritize them after we find them. We look from attacker's point of view and we build a likely attacker profile. We identify what the attacker is interested in, what kind of assets, and the attack vectors. Threat modeling tries to answer questions like where are the high value assets? Where am I most vulnerable to attack? What are the most relevant threats? And is there an attack vector that might go, uh, get a notice? During threat modeling process, we draw end-to-end -end, uh, scenarios, like deployment scenarios. We identify roles and key usage scenarios for the application. We identify the technologies, the application security mechanisms, and the trust boundaries. We need to know where the endpoints are that the attacker may attack. So the strike threat modeling process was developed by two guys in Microsoft. And there is a free book that you can find through Google for strike threat modeling. It's very good. And it's what the strike threat modeling helps us do is identify security threats and it helps us reason. So there are six categories standing for the each uh, letter of the word stripe. So the first one, first one, S stands for spoofing identity, which is illegally accessing another person's data using the authentication information. T stands for tampering with data, and it's about malicious modifications and unauthorized changes to the data. Repudiation, or R, stands for means to deny performing a malicious actions. Or easily to understand is like the non-repudiation, which refers to the ability of the system to counter repudiation threats. I stands for information disclosure, which is exposing information to individuals who should not have access to it. And D in the stride model stands for denial of service. It is a threat to the system availability and reliability. And it's denial of service to users that should have access to it. Elevation of privileges is uh, actually somebody elevating their privileges to become an authorized user of the system. I have several more of these slides that are about the framework. So after that, it will become uh, easier to uh, talk and be more like a discussion because I will be talking about real life experience with uh, security reviews. But it's important to understand the basics and how, uh, why we do things during the security reviews. So the OAPS ASVS, which is Application Security Verification Standard, is a list of application security requirements of tests that can be used by architects, developers, testers, and security professionals. What it provides is a list of tests that pen testers can use, but we need to understand because they identified what a secure application is. ASVS, one of the main goals of ASVS is to provide consumers and vendors understanding of what secure application is. You can find on the internet, it's a PDF, so all apps in general provides all the documentation on their website. And it's a good place to go and review all the requirements for secure applications. They have different levels depending on the compliance requirements for your application. If you're a bank, PCI, 
you will have higher uh, compliance regulation. OFSM is Software Assurance Maturity Model. And it's an open framework to help organizations implement a strategy for software security. It evaluates uh, the organization existing software security practices and gives guidance how to improve them. It provides building a balanced software security assurance program in well-defined iterations. So there are all these functions and security practices and it's an interview process that you go with the software development team and they answer. Uh, there is different grade that they get and then we set up a goal and in six months we revisit. And we have a clear indication if they have improved or not. Yeah. Uh, ideally, you will start in the design phase, and you will. Uh, of, I don't know if uh, the question. Maybe I should repeat the question. So the question is, when do we do uh, the SAM interview? Ideally, we start in the design phase, and in six months we compare the results. But you give heads up, heads up to the development team how to perform. We are very decentralized co company, so we have a lot of development teams. The good thing is that if you one time you go through the process with one development team, that will cover all of their applications. It's more about how they uh, perform their processes and uh, do they have training for the developers for security training and stuff. Thank you. So BISM, it's very similar to SAM, is building security and maturity model. So again, maturity model here, security maturity model, and it's a data-driven uh, model developed through the analysis of software security initiatives, also known as application security programs. It's detailed and sophisticated measuring stick for software security initiatives. So in the last BISM 10 document, there were 122 companies participating. And companies include uh, Splunk, PayPal, Box, Adobe, Capital One, Wells Fargo, and others. So there are eight industry verticals, and three verticals of them are very highly regulated. Insurance, healthcare, and financial uh, services. What BISM does, it doesn't tell you what to do. It compares what you're doing with the other companies. So they collect the, all this data. So if you see this spider web looking graph, the green is all companies and the, uh, the light green and the blue navy green is the example company, how it compares with the other companies <coughs> in the model. So here comes the easy part for me because I'm going to just talk about experience, right? We covered all the frameworks that I wanted to cover. Who participates in security review? So we, <laughs> you want to participate? <laughs> we can start right now. <laughs> yes. So let me uh, repeat the question. The question is if the security practitioner is going to be integrated in the development team and participate in the security reviews of code during the development phases, right? It depends a lot on how the company uh, implements uh, the security reviews. It's hard to scale. In our company, we have a lot of developers and a small security team. So we actually rely on security champions integrated in the, each development team. Somebody that has focus on security 
and is going to watch out for uh, these regular security reviews. When we perform security review from the security department, that will be the next level. So coming back to the participants, we have mandatory and optional roles. So architect, lead developer, somebody that understands the technology inside out is required at the security review. Then we have the business representative. The process as is recommended, we require it. And for us, it's extremely important somebody that understands the business inside out or the business process behind the application to be present there, even if it's the project manager. We have the security representative, which is the role that I usually perform in, somebody that can communicate the risks and the different mitigation efforts that can uh, happen. And compliance, depending on your company, that will be a different person for compliance. In our company, we are mostly concerned with privacy. So I will always invite somebody from our privacy team to be part of the security review. They can communicate the compliance requirements for the company. Yeah. How many members of the security team are technically compliant? Compliant. So the question is how technically sophisticated are the business representative and the compliance? We invite them because we want to get the compliance, so the legal perspective and the business perspective. So technical, it's not required. It's desired, but usually these are the people that are already in the field. Our privacy team, they have been through so many security reviews that they know a lot of the technical jargon and they understand what our application security program looks like. Especially when we do third party evaluations for vendors, our privacy team often asks similar questions to what security is concerned with. How is the data secured in transit? Uh, how is the data secured in REST, right? Uh, privacy will be concerned where are we saving our data, which region, right? And the business representative, as I said, often is the business owner who has worked already with the development team or the project manager who is between the two teams anyhow. Yeah? Is there uh, a role that looks at the data schema involved in, in the application to ensure that the application only accesses yes. uh, the relevant data that it's, it's supposed to access? I like how you're thinking, so the question is, uh, do we look at the data schema, do we look at the different privileges for the different users? You are ahead of me, so I have slides for that. We actually look at the security principles. <laughs> so how the process works is, the first one is the initiation. And in our company, it's usually initialized by the development team. I apologize, it's hard to read. But what happens is, ideally, at the design phase, the development team will reach out to us and say, we're developing this product. Can we sit down and review it and figure out the security requirements? The next one is the system discovery. During this phase, I will be requesting do documentation from the dev teams. I have a slide on documentation. And then we do different meetings. We um, talk through the system, through the email, uh, and collect information. Once we are done, there will be a document with the risk and the issues the infrastructure has or the application has and some remediation effort. And the last step, number five, is we plan for the mitigation of the risk. And I will cover that too. So documentation, in this day and age, in the agile world, Developers often believe they shouldn't produce documentation because it changes so fast, right? But it's so important. <laughs> the first reason is to identify the risk. During the security review, we cannot guess things. We need to actually understand what your application does. And the next one is to support the system. We, you need documentation for the support team in order to understand and support the system. And the last one is for incident handling. As I mentioned at the start, I'm part of the, our incident response team. And when an incident occurs, the first responder needs to understand the application very, very fast. 
and you don't have time to reach out to every development team and understand what the application does. So we have created a one page, very straightforward, what kind of documentation is the minimum documentation for system required from the development team. And it includes contacts to understand who is the application lead, who is the infrastructure lead, who to reach out, the business lead. Right? Then we cover infrastructure. We require infrastructure diagram. And it's extremely important during the security review to look at the infrastructure diagram. Yes? Yes. So we have uh, several types of diagrams, and sometimes they can be combined, right, depending how the team wants to approach it. And we uh, let them, uh, some teams uh, do different diagrams, right? We don't have a strict requirement how they have to diagram, but data flow diagrams, as you mentioned, component diagram, uh, deployment diagram, logic flow diagram, all of them will cover most of what we're trying to do. And I have a slide as well. During threat modeling process, you actually use the whiteboard and you uh, draw some diagram as well. So the next one, uh, the next section, which is very dear to my heart, is uh, logging. And logging is very important from forensic standpoint of view, and I will have a, a, a slide on it, and I will explain more, but it's a very easy topic to cover during the security review, because it doesn't require pen testing, it requires just asking, tell me all of your log sources, and let me see a sample of your logs. So interviews. I love security reviews because of the interviews. If you have curious personality, if you like asking questions like Bill on the first row, uh, <laughs> you will be great at security reviews because it's a very natural pr uh, process of talking with the development team and asking them how they do things. I usually prepare before I go to the uh, interview section. I read all the documentation. I prepare my questions, but I'm very flexible. I know that once I go there, depending on the answer, I can change direction. So it's very important to be flexible during the security review process and the interview because some answers will make you think, okay, I need to deep, dig, uh, dig deeper in that area. That, that something doesn't sound right, right? So um, we may spend some time on a different section than I planned. Another thing I want to mention here is that I mentioned four people that are necessary for the security review, but that's not often the case. I often get 20 people on the call, and it's hard because we have one hour to conduct the meeting, and everybody needs to be heard. So I try to stay strictly to the plan that I have with the modifications, but manage the interview process depending on the people you have in the room or on the uh, phone. This is the whiteboard diagram that I was talking about. So it's very important during threat modeling to draw things with the team so everybody's on the same page and talk about how the data flows, the different transport protocols between the different modules. If you're performing web application security review, you should be familiar with the OAuth top 10. OAuth stands for Open Web Application Security Project, and it's an international nonprofit organization dedicated to web application security. The most core principle is that the materials will be freely available on their website, which makes it possible for everyone to go and get the information. I talked about OAuth SAM and OAuth's ASVS, but probably the most well-known project is the OAuth top 10. And these are the top 10 vulnerabilities that they have identified based on data from different companies. You will not be able to cover all of them through the security review. You, I mean, of course, if you're using SaaS DAS tools, some of these will come up, like SQL injection or CSER, but some of them you can cover, like the insufficient logging and monitoring. 
I, can, I, I keep coming back to the logging. For me, it's very, very important to be covered, and it's something that OAPS has identified for several years as one of the top 10 insufficient logging and monitoring as one of the top 10 risks for web applications. So what questions do we ask during a security review? As I said, it's probably around 50 questions, I would say the average for a security review, but these are uh, sample questions. So I will start with warm up question, like what the, your application does, right? Who are your uh, consumers? What are the business use cases? How do you provision access? Who has access? Who has different access, right, capabilities in the application? How is your system handling errors? So there are different questions that we will go through during the security review. Security principles are very important to understand when you're performing security review. And here, some of them, the minimizing attack service. Of course, if you have less endpoints, attacker can attack less, right? So minimizing the attack surface, we will cover during the security review, do you have some unused components that doesn't need to be in production? The least privileges principle is to provide just enough access to do the job, but don't over provision access. So use a limited user account, configure the firewall, use role-based security, and of course, lever process. During security review, I covered the lever process. It's extremely important because some applications may have thousands of users. And if somebody leaves the job or changes position in the company, their account should be deprovisioned. Separation of duty, is separating the roles for the different entities. Defense in depth is one of the oldest security principles. We in the security field know that the system can be compromised. So overlaying different layers to protect an attacker escalating through the network is very important. Fail securely, which means that if your application fails, you don't disclose too much information. The weakest link, so here is one point to make. When I do the security review, I work with the development team. They have built this application and they often know if something is exposed to risk or they did something wrong. Not wrong, but they didn't configure it correctly. So it's important to ask them to contribute and to say, what are the risks that they see with their application? They're the ones that know what's the weakest link. And your application is as strong as your weakest link. So work with your development team, empower them, because they are often under budget constraints. So they know what's right to do, but they don't have time or the budget to do it. It's not prioritized enough. So technical deep dive. In the previous slide, there was the TIA triad. And when we uh, do security review, we are concerned with the CIA triad when it comes to data, what we protect. So the first one, the availability. We look for server uptime, backups, DDoS protection, confidentiality. We look at encryption, authentication, and authorization methods. Integrity, we look at checksum, hashes, digital signatures, and encrypted transport protocols. The roles and permission uh, metrics, it's very important and something easy for the development team to look at and understand. I got this example from the internet. <laughs> I didn't have time to uh, create a sample. But it's a very easy uh, way of understanding what are the capabilities and roles for different users and groups in your application. So logging, why do we need custom logging? Usually your uh, web application is living on some operating system and web platform. And IIS, Apache, they log by default. And we have the operating system logging. 
But custom application logging is extremely important for security. And we need to record security incidents and policy violations through logging to maintain evidence for legal proceedings, to gather information on application errors, to detect and alert of possible intrusions in progress or identify the early stages of an attack. We need logging to measure application performance and to assure availability. And to maintain audit log for investigations and forensics. I'm in forensics. If your application doesn't log, it's very hard to reconstruct the event after it happens. So what to log? Accurate timestamps, user <coughs> authentication events, additional security relevant data related to application errors, file and disk access errors, sensitive input, account management events, suspicious user input, unusual or excessive activities, and security policy violations. These are things to actually lock. And this one is what not to lock. It's equally important what not to lock. And that will be data prohibited by local laws and regulations or regulatory agencies. Don't log any authentication ID identifiers or accession tokens, passwords, database connection strings, and encryption keys. Don't log PCI data, like sensitive bank, credit card information, financial information. And don't log file pads, server names, or other relevant infrastructure information. And of course, don't log source code and SQL statements. So once we identify the risk, what do we do with the risk? Our role in the security field is to identify the risk and to propose some mitigation steps. But it's ultimately the business that's going to decide how to deal with the risk. So there are several possibilities. One is risk acceptance. So if the business accepts the risk, that means that they accept the full responsibility if something happens. The next one is risk avoidance which is shutting down the website. Okay, we decided it's too risky, it's too much money to fix it, we are not going to release it to the public. Risk transfer is when you get insurance policy and you transfer the risk to somebody else. And the last one, which is the most likely way of progressing is risk mitigation. So you implement controls in place to mitigate the risk, to lower the risk. But as I said, we often rely on the business. And if they decide to do risk acceptance, we may ask them to sign an exception. Somebody higher up is going to say, I take this risk. In conclusion, I hope I answer questions today. Why, why should we perform security review? Why is it important? And what should be covered in a security review? Often depends on how, uh, what kind of data or assets you have. So two security reviews are not the same, and that's very hard to put them into one framework. We have small components and we have enterprise size applications. We have applications that deal with sensitive PII data, and we have applications that don't have any sensitive data. So depending on the data, the assets, that will show you what to cover. And how to perform an application security review? I hope we answer this question and the takeaways from the security application review. Yes. I have a question. At the time of the risk review, uh -huh. the risk can be detected from the security activity or just the event that you have. So let's say I'm from the security team, right, and I propose um, implement a web application firewall. So depending which team is actually administering the web application firewall, they have to work together. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Yeah. That's an excellent question. So the question is, who is responsible for the mitigation steps? An example is when a business flaw is identified as risky. 
And in that case, is the only um, team that's able to mitigate for it will be the development team to work with the business team and identify what the business uh, logic should be. And we can do iterations of the security review. So it's not a static process. After some changes uh, in the application, we will do again a security review. So to answer your question, it depends. It depends on how your company works, who is involved. But during security review, our responsibility is just to highlight the risk and uh, suggest some steps. Then it will be a decision of the development team and the process how they address it. Documentation. So the question, thank you very much for the question. So the question is, uh, I mentioned a one-page document uh, that we keep for the documentation, the required minimum documentation for system, and what is our process to keep it updated and up-to-date. So we have different collaboration systems uh, that we use. As I said, we are very decentralized. So a good place will be Confluence or uh, a two-white box that you can collaborate with the team. But what we do based on the different security reviews and if we find something new actually uh, helpful or from documentation standpoint uh, view, we will update this document and uh, everybody that has access to it will get it. So the question is, uh, as we identify a mitigation plan, do uh, executives look at that? Yeah, do we uh, sort of, you know, which management system yeah. goes to those kind of immediately available risks? Yeah. And to answer again, it depends on the system. Some systems are very, uh, very highly visible. I was doing a security review currently, and I had to escalate to our CISO and he to work with our CIO because of that system impacted so much of our infrastructure. If it's a small application, it may be enough that the business owner knows. And if uh, the, mitiga so the mitigation steps usually will be implemented with the development team in mind. So if they know and they prioritize it in their um, cadence, they actually are enough to uh, address them. So it depends on the system. So the question, which I repeat with a lot of pleasure, is that we are very <laughs> <laughs> that we are very mature compared to other companies in our process. That it's much cheaper to address things in the design phase and during the development stages than after the application goes to production and, and a pen tester like Jeff uh, actually finds the vulnerability. And the answer is we have a very mature team. I'm probably the most junior on the team. James is here. He is heading our chief uh, security architecture. And Veronica is our head of operations. So I stand on the shoulders of giants. And uh, it doesn't happen overnight. It has been a long process to get there. But uh, we, we rely on education and uh, we try to implement the best on the market. So uh, we have a lot of freedom in the team to push for new standards and to try to implement best practices. Um, 
So the question is, how long have we been doing that, and when did we start seeing results? So results, I can start seeing the moment we start performing the security review. For me, it's extremely important when the development team starts seeing value of what we're bringing as issues. And this edu it's an education process, because during security review, you ask the questions, and the uh, light bulb goes into the development team and says, okay, we need to care about that, right? And the business starts appreciating how security is important and how hard it is to think about all the components. So we see um, results right away with every security review, each one person of the development of the business team that we bring to a secure mindset is already a result. And how long have we been doing that? Longer than I'm in the team. <laughs> I come from a developer background and uh, I fit very well in the security review uh, process with my background, but our team has been doing it for a very long time. I can if you want. Yes, if you find value. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, please, uh, I'm on all social media. If you want to connect, you're welcome. Yeah. For uh, the dog. Oh. <laughs> your first, your, your first, first 100 questions. <laughs> <laughs> I will package it as a new product and I will sell it on the market. <laughs> yeah, for the documentation, uh, yeah, I, I will look at it, into it and uh, check what we can post. I really appreciate this question, and the question is one takeaway, because it's so hard to getting it done, how do we get it done in an organization? And this alludes to something Michael on the back there and me talked yesterday. It's so important, the security team, to not be seen as a roadblock. It's extremely important we to be partners, and we have accomplished in our company that other departments look for us for service. They actually see value of what we provide. We don't tell them what to do. We explain why they should do the right thing. So it's an important process that you build trust and bring value to them and uh, they will start coming to you. That's what we have seen, that uh, more security reviews we do, more teams actually find value in it. Yeah, we don't say no. <laughs> we give you an exception to sign, but we don't say no. <laughs> Thank you so much, and uh, I really appreciate it.